Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name's Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. You cannot buy this kind of entertainment around the world right now. We had a presidential debate, the presidential debate last night. We are filming this on Friday morning. And I'll tell you what, I've got a guest that is not only, he is a, a very knowledgeable Substack author, and I reached out to him before last night. And then we are discussing his Substack articles today. Welcome, Dr. Vance Ginn. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing well, Stu. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'll tell you what, we live in a energy, political, I don't know if it's a nightmare. What's going on around the world right now? Holy smokes. It's all over the place, you know, and that was that was a heck of a, a, a debate last night. It was tough to watch whenever you're seeing what's going on and what they're saying and mumbling and everything else. I'll tell you what, Vance, it just absolutely makes me, drives me nuts. I think the success of our podcast, our individual podcast, you have an individual podcast as well, too, Vance, That's right. right? Let and People Prosper is the name of the podcast. Let People Prosper. Let People Prosper, and it is Let the People Prosper, VanceGinnSubStack.com. I want to give you that shout out first. It's a great Substack. People need to subscribe to you. VanceGinnSubStack.com. We'll have that in the show notes. But I'll tell you what, our, I think people are tired of the mainstream media because when you see... I have to hand it to CNN. I think they did a good job, but was this a setup to get Biden out? It seems like it could be that way. I mean, the way that he did so poorly during that right. entire debate would indicate to me that they're going to be questioning things. And then as soon as the debate was over, CNN, of all places, CNN, their whole group was basically roasting President Biden. And oh, the Twitter about feed, how X feeds were nuts last yes. night. It really was. I wasn't expecting that, especially from CNN. So it was almost like they were teeing up him to leave and step down from running for a reelection and having someone else step in. But this morning, as of 1108, when we're filming this advance, the Biden White House said, we're still in it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a wild few months. I mean, we're getting closer. It's already, like you said, the end of June. So we only have a few months left. There's not much they can change between now and then. It's really going to be about well, we just like if some people are going to say, well, we just like the direction that the eco the economy or the country is going, although that's becoming few and far between. Fifty two percent of Americans believe we're in a recession. Right. Now, the, 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 the high level numbers don't indicate that when you look at GDP and everything else. But that's how people feel, given the inflation and everything else that's around them. And, and your stuff is just fantastic. If everybody get, take a look at this state jobs level report from BLS overview, Texas. We added 41,800 jobs in May at 3.9% unemployment. Go Texas. Love me some Texas. That's right. California, May is 5.2 unemployment of known known employables, I guess. Never yeah. mind. Sorry, that was a bad joke. Interest <laughs> rates. And when we talk about red state policies work, I love the way you phrase that. Well, that's right. I mean, when you look at just those numbers alone, and yes, California added more jobs in the month of May than Texas did. But we also got to remember that California is larger. They've got a larger labor force, larger population right. and things of that nature. Their percent change was 0.3% growth in Texas, but compared to a 0.2% in California. And if you look right. over the last year, Texas is, is, is growing almost twice as fast as the state of California. And so when, and this is across the board, when you look at states like Texas, Florida, Tennessee, even some in Oklahoma, the, the larger red states compared to California, New York, and Illinois, you can see this dichotomy where red state policy, the pro-growth policies of less government right. spending, lower regulation, and lower taxes, that really trumps the things that you can do with higher taxes and higher regulations and higher spending. I want to ask this opinion. I, this just came out across the wire, and I, this is totally unscripted, Vance. So you're going to get this is a little bit of a test. All right. The, the International Monetary Fund, which is a worldwide elite global money grabbing thing, just issued a warning to the U.S. for our printing money and our bad energy policies. I never thought I would see the day that the international monetary policy would tell the United States we have bad policies. Same here. Same here. Wow. I, that's that's unbelievable. I'm going to have to go check that out when we get off because that is that is totally incredible that IMF would say something like that. And it's but it's true. I mean, we, we've had excessive government spending leads to massive right. deficits and debt. 
we're paying more on net interest payments of, of more of a trillion dollars than we do on national defense of 860, right. 870 billion dollars. And you include the Federal Reserve in there of the money printing that they've done over the last few years. Yes, the balance sheet's coming down now, but their balance sheet's still at 7.2 trillion compared to right. the 4 trillion before the pandemic. This is still a lot of money that's sloshing around the economy. And then we wonder why inflation still remains hotter than the 2% that they would like for it to be. Oh, and, and when you look at the charts, energy costs for the consumers is up 35% from when Trump took in. 35% energy takes, I mean, it affects everything. Yeah, it does. It really does. And so that's going to trickle down, if you will, to all of our other prices that we pay, because it is a direct portion of that, a run of the raw materials that's in almost everything that we that we use. Everything from your barista yeah. to your burrito. I mean, yeah. it, it is just, hey, that could be a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, when we sit back and take a look at this, you also brought up school choice. What were your thoughts on that one? Well, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. I hope that there would have been during the debate. But so far, we've heard from Trump that he's in favor of school choice. Biden's not been in favor Boy, of school choice. He did not answer that. He spent time on the other one, didn't he? He, he did, went, though. He, yeah. he, and as well, he should. But what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I really, I really hopeful that states, I mean, ultimately that's where the, that school choice should happen is at the state level, right. not at the federal level. I don't want the federal government to be more involved with education. If anything, I think we should need to end the Department of Education. And so the, the state of Texas and others, I think need to get on board. There have been 12 states that already have passed universal school choice. Texas should be the next one. And I think it will happen next year after the elections that happened with the, with the primary elections and the Republican Party and the runoffs that happened this year. What I'm this is a self-serving note here for just a moment, and that is I'm trying to put together a a program for homeschoolers so that take all of my podcast and the like the all the podcasts that we produce for homeschool energy material. And I have all years of training material lined up for this, and we're putting it together because we need journeymen. We need folks to go into the trades. We need alternatives for education because schools are getting horrible out there. Well, that's exactly right. And I mean, I think that's one of the things with universal education savings accounts is that you empower parents mm. to do what's going to be best for their, their kids. And every kid is unique. And whether it be the careers they want to go on to into later on or what they want to study. And so I think that's a great opportunity, though, is for the homeschoolers. You know, Stu, from kindergarten to second grade, I went to a small private school that right. my mom worked at because we didn't have a lot of money. That's the only reason I got to go. And then from third right. grade to sixth grade, I went to a public school. And this is all in Houston, South Houston, Texas, where I grew up. And then from seventh grade through 12th grade, I went to homeschool. So I got all those different attributes and, and being able to learn from those to, to really understand why it's so important to have school choice. And unfortunately, too many people, especially those with lower income and lower means, don't have the opportunity to do so. And I hope right. that they oh, all yeah. get that opportunity soon. Well, and that's why I want to do the homeschool thing to help out because there are people that are trapped in cities that can't move to somewhere else. That's I mean, exactly if you're in right. a blue city and or a blue state, you're trapped like a rat. You need to help educate your kids. Hey, let, let's yeah. do some fact check because I was sitting here and I, I was looking at this. Okay, if Trump gets rid of the tax, the IRS, and he gets rid of the education system, you know, and brings it back to the states, but yet he's going to put, you know, we, we talk about putting in tariffs on everybody else to replace the taxes what are your thoughts on that because uh, biden was dreaming that he i mean i i mean excuse me he was responding and saying that it was going to be another exorbitant inflation what are your thoughts well you know I, i've been writing about this and i worked in the trump administration from june 2019 to may of 2020 of the as a chief economist for the office of management and budget and so in in, in, in i think that the tax cuts and jobs act were a good thing but the problem is, is, is our tariffs, right? Like I think the tariffs are a tax on Americans, on imported goods. And so right. while it may seem like a good idea to put in tariffs to replace income taxes, which I, I wish we didn't have income taxes either, it would, it would be a substantial increase in tariffs. I mean, just the amount of tariffs that are brought in on, on goods right. that are imported are not that large compared to the amount of income taxes that are being brought in. And we're already running, you know, a trillion and a half to $2 trillion deficits. You would need substantial increases in tariffs to bring down that gap. And so ultimately, I don't think this is a good idea. I would rather, I'd rather Trump focus on cutting government spending 
and reducing income taxes right. versus imposing a larger tariff. And, and one other thing here on this I think is important is that taxes should also be felt. Like, so when you have government spending, I want it to be directly connected to the taxes that we pay for that government spending. Tariffs make it an indirect cost because many people think that we're charging foreigners to pay for those, those taxes when it's really American. So it's an indirect embedded tax in the economy. And so while yeah. it worked well in the early parts of our revolution with Hamilton and others, I do not think that tariffs should be a good part of our tax system today. I absolutely love the way you just described that because I was sitting there scratching my feeble brain trying to go through that. Yeah. And, and I, what a great answer. No wonder, <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Hey, you know, you know, podcast hosting is, is tough, but yes. you just have to have great guests. Yeah. Right. That's so, right. When we talk about the grid and we talk about some real problems that may be coming around the corner for the grid. And when we talk about the grid physics, and fiscal responsibility matter to low cost energy. Yeah. And I loved your number four section in here with the Texas energy. Yeah. Texas energy is going to have some issues moving forward. The Texas Tribune recently had an article talking about, well, there was a hearing. And so they were talking about this hearing by the Texas Senate, looking at what's going to be the future demand for Texas energy. And part of that's going to go to crypto and AI. Like that, that could be about right. 50% of new demand moving forward. What do we do about it? Instead right. of being so concerned about subsidizing things, which the, you know, the legislature passed this Texas Energy Fund last year to basically give low interest loans to start up natural gas projects because right. of all the push of federal production tax credits and things of that nature and the uh, green energy deal. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act. That was the por the porculus bill, as Dan Bongino would call yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. You, know, you have all this that they're trying to counter, and I think right. we need more abundance within our energy sector by level of the playing field, remove the, right. the, the subsidies and tax breaks and everything else, have a level playing field. And ultimately, Stu, I think we need to head more towards, towards nuclear energy. I think that is really going to be like a big part of the future along with natural gas. I'm a big fan of nuclear. I find I signed the oil and gas executives for in support of nuclear with Douglas Sandridge's organization. Love nuclear. And I'm afraid that what we're about on the verge of is a discrepancy between microgrids you have data centers that are coming in. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to afford to put in backup and redundancy for those grids because the balancing authorities are shooting themselves in the head. I would not want to be a balancing authority. That's like going to be an air traffic controller in a war zone, trying to keep the grid, you know, when you have renewable wind and then you have this and you're trying to keep a balanced grid. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a nightmare. Nightmare. Yeah, that's, that's right. And so we're going to have a lot of issues from, from one time to the next to dealing with Texas energy. And with so many people moving here, Stu, from California and a lot of these other blue states, we're going to have a huge increase in population. And so we're going to see more and more demands for our energy over time. So we've got to think about it from an abundance standpoint. How do we get more exactly. energy out there like compared to less? Yeah, I like the way you think, but let's yeah. let's have a Texas shirt made. Maybe we can have this as the yeah. Dr. Ginn way to look at things. And that is leave your voting policies behind. Yeah. Yes, yes. You know, we cannot have the grid run by this. And then the federal debt chart. I, I'm going to just absolutely, I get air sick when I see this. Oh man, it's terrible. And and so, yeah, another piece that I talked about was the Congressional Budget Office, which is considered to be nonpartisan. We could question that, but considered to be nonpartisan. They're expecting for us to have another $20 trillion in added to the dollars added to the national debt over the next 10 years, meaning going from $34 trillion to $54 trillion in a short period of time. And, and, and by... 2034, they're expecting to have nearly $3 trillion in deficits. And so this is in a, in a, in a, in a consideration of a peacetime, right? We don't have major wow. wars going on or anything else, and we're running massive deficits. And, and there's been a lot of talk or lack of talk on the Republicans and the Democrats of how do we deal with this. We've got to do something with Social Security and Medicare. I know it's politically difficult to talk about, right. but at the end of the day, these are the things that are two-thirds of our budget. Two out of every three dollars are just on those two programs. If you're not talking about doing anything with those, we're not going to reduce the size and scope of right. government spending over time. Hey, I got an idea. Yeah. Close the border and don't give it to illegal immigrants. Well, that's another good part of this. And I think <laughs> the, the, the flip side of it is, is that 
those people who are, are moving here, if we had them here legally, I, I think we need a, immigration reform has got to be a part of this discussion. Yes. Because if we had them here legally, they would be paying into the system as well. Exactly. <laughs> I, I wanted to go on record that I love immigrant legally. Yes. I, I want, if you want to be here legally, I'm all in. This is not a, you know, only American. No, no. I'm a mutt. I am a mutt. I like yeah. being a mutt. I love everybody. But get here legally. Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. exactly right. And I'm, I'm concerned sometimes, too, that we get so focused. <laughs> some of those that are on the right will want to say, you know, we just need a border wall and we just need to close it down and that will solve all our problems. And uh -huh. it won't. We're still going to have demand for those workers from businesses that are here because we have a high cost of doing business in America from higher corporate taxes, higher minimum wages. So we right. incentivize them to want to, to, to employ them. But there's also going to be a supply problem because more people still want to keep coming to America because they are disenfranchised in many of the places south of the border, but, but also across the world. I want to add supply and demand as yeah. an economist. What happens when you have 30 million whatever the number is, let's say this past year has been 5 million people, I believe, that the Biden administration let in across the border that are getting free things. Of those 5 million, let's say 2.5 million of them are military age men that mm. are getting free things now. And then when Trump wins, they shut all their free stuff off and they get grumpy. Yeah. This is not set up for a win. No, I think it's going to be a tough situation. And and there's a lot of things that, at least legally, they, they don't get, quote unquote, free. I always say nothing is free because there's always a cost to someone. But but there's a lot of them like food stamps and Medicaid that even if you're here illegally, I mean, you can't access, you're undocumented. You're not able to get access to those like Medicaid. Now, sometimes they will get access through documentation that they can use. And that's, I think, what you're talking about here. Right. But it'll be very interesting to see what that looks like. One of the things that I i don't know could quite happen is Trump talks about, you know, deporting all those here illegally. Yeah. I don't know how quite that works. I think it sounds good politically and rhetorically, but, but going around trying to get her corralling everybody together <laughs> thinking about it as cows or something uh, if you're corralling them all together it's gonna be very difficult because they're spread out across the entire country now yeah because secretary mayorkas who should be in jail has been flying them in bypassing go get on the app and then fly in yeah and he's dropping them in red states yeah it, you know it, it's it's unbelievable what we're seeing out of Congress. It was unbelievable what we saw last night, mainly with Biden at the, the debate. <laughs> but Congress can't get their act together where it comes to spending or immigration. They want to keep passing the buck. And this buck is going to come due very soon. If not, it, if, I think it's here already. Oh, yeah. And you and I are just asking questions because yeah. we don't know. But I'll tell you, your, your other point here on the Supreme Court ruling on censoring free speech scares me. Yeah. Yeah. So they came down in this Murthy versus Missouri. Some call it Murthy versus Biden. And they they voted they they voted to to, to basically go towards that Biden won <laughs> Missouri won, wow. saying that the government can censor speech on social media. This is just nonsense. Now, the Supreme Court will make the case that what was brought to them didn't have enough measure, enough weight for them to judge it. But I think they should have taken this on and said, you know what, this is not the role of government. This is this violates the First right. Amendment free speech. And so now, since the Supreme Court isn't going to do it, I'm hopeful that Congress will act and make sure that the government isn't the one that's putting pressure on these social media companies along the way. Boy, I think this is something that Senator Ted Cruz needs to champion and get legal done right. That's right. This yep. one would scare me to death. In fact, I think I'm going to call his office right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, he, he's, one, he's a cool cat. I love yeah. being from Texas and having good senators and and good people. I He's a good dude. I'm visiting with a bunch of folks today about the Chevron Supreme Court mm -hmm. ruling that just came out on the, on the regulatory issues on that. I haven't even gotten prepped for that one yet. That should be pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that's huge, Stu. I mean, this is so Chevron deference is basically has given the uh, legal authority for agencies in the federal government 
to do to, to basically interpret what the legislation that's passed. And so they right. do a lot more of that interpreting compared to what Congress should be doing. Congress has passed the buck on this because of Chevron deference over time. It gave them incentive to do so. And so now with overturning Chevron with this case, I think it's going to be very important, not only for Congress to come in and actually, you know, write out the law job. that they, they want, do their job. There you go. <laughs> but it will take it away from these unelected bureaucrats in D.C. I mean, they're running the show and unfortunately running our lives in the process. You know, I want to ask a question because when we did not run a debt and the only way in years past before yeah. the Fed, before was it 1912, 1913? 13, 1913. 1913, you had to present your budget. You had to get it approved and we didn't print money. What happens if we get rid of the Fed besides people getting knocked, droned? As they, as, as they say, but yeah. I mean, if we got rid of the fed and we went back to that only, would we ever get out of debt? It would help because right now what the fed does is they monetize the debt, which, which is why we have so much inflation across the economy. And before 1913, I mean, we did run some deficits. There were, there were deficits that were going on, but remember that our dollar was backed by gold and not by fiat currency and, and, and government debt like it is today. So today there is a incentive for Congress to run deficits and for the Fed to print money and right. continue to run deficits into the into oblivion versus back then there was actually something that was more grounded in sound economic policy before the Federal Reserve was put in place. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. I haven't got you all teed up on this, but with Saudi Aramco, I mean, Saudi Arabia not renewing or signing again the petrodollar. Yeah. There is a huge, because the petrodollar, we've had abysmal purchasing going on of the treasuries right now who wants to buy the u.s debt when the petrodollar and then you have bricks coming in sneaking around the world on this kind of thing what are your thoughts on saudi arabia or the petrodollar because the weaponization of the petrodollar and sanctions against russia has created the dark fleet yeah the dark fleet then has then created oh by the way Russia just passed Japan for the number four country in the world in their economy. Yeah. This is unbelievable. What are yeah. your thoughts on the petrodollar? Well, you know, I, I, I think it goes back to what we've been talking about here is the lack of sound policy in America that they don't have this. We don't have the credibility. <laughs> but go back up over here. <laughs> yeah. B Biden kept talking about we're the strongest economy in the world and we have all this credibility across the globe. And that's just ridiculous. This is another example of that is they're willing to sell off the dollar to move towards other currencies because they don't feel like we're as safe as once we once were. And we're not given our right. inflation, given our deficits and debt, given given the, the credit downgrades that we've had over the last couple of years by the credit rating agencies, all this is adding up. And, and even China is selling off a lot of their debt that they own from the United States because they don't want to be involved with it either. And so all of this is going to contribute to higher inflation, higher interest rates, and a slower economy here in America because we can't get our own fiscal and monetary house in order. Do you think, and, and let me throw this at you. Vance, by the way, I just love all of your stuff because you, you got some knowledge and just being an old farm kind of guy, I like being able to talk to experts and you're, you're hitting it out of the park. But as we, we sit here and we take a look at uh, where do we go next with the deindustrialization of Germany going on with their hmm. green energy policies have just obliterated their whole economy. And, yeah. and this morning I was walking by and one of my day traders was over here and he's, he's saying, Hey man, all these green things are going South. People think Trump's going to win and all these green investments are going to go away. I don't see that happening, but I see a trend sh shifting away. Yeah, I think so. I, I think you're right. I mean, Germany is basically going back to heating houses with wood, if you can believe it because of all their policies. And, and we don't want to head in that direction. I don't want to use wood and heat my house and everything. There yeah. are better ways to go in green, meaning cleaner burning fuels, which is natural gas. 
I mean, exactly. we've had carbon emissions declining for years now in America, and we didn't join the Paris Accord. Biden got back into it re more recently, but we haven't taken these huge deindustrialization de approach like Germany right. and some of those other European countries, and, and we're moving in the right direction. Even if you want to consider CO2 as being a harmful pollutant, which EPA doesn't even consider it that, if you oh, do yeah. want to consider that, we're doing the best in the world, so why would we change? We need, we need more free market capitalism and less of this socialist top-down approach. I, I knew I liked you. But let me, <laughs> let me throw this one at you as well, because when we take a look at net zero and we and we go to sit back and we look at energy policies, we're printing money and, and you know, you cannot print money and have to be fiscally responsible. I don't see us even getting to net zero. I want to ask the question, why? Because last year, the U.S. lowered our CO2 output by I believe it was 22 percent and we did it by increasing our natural gas power plants that's what the EIA put out while last year there's 400 coal plants going online in in China and they went up 220 percent there's wow. nothing we can do if we try to go net zero we're still going to pollute the world the green new deal is not going to do a thing Nope. But what it will do, and you're exactly right, I agree with everything you just said, but what the Green New Deal will do is run up our deficits and run up inflation and interest rates and hurt the American consumer in the process, even at a time where we're trying to do good things, it's not going to help us. You know, Milton Friedman said, don't judge a policy by its intentions, but by its results. And the results are like that. that we're having larger economic costs for us, even though they may have good intentions. How do people find you again? We have your Substack is vancegensubstack.com. Is that the main place? That's the main place. You can also go to vancegen.com where you can find my you can find my Substack. <clears throat> you can also find my podcast, which is on all major platforms. Apple Podcasts Great. and so forth. But those are the main places. I'm also on X or formerly known as Twitter, Advanced Gin. I, I post a lot I, on there daily to try to keep people informed about sound economic policy and better ways to let people prosper. I'll tell you what, I want to have you back. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I want to make sure that I don't spread it wrong information because I, I like fact checking myself if that makes sense <laughs> yeah you know I, i'd be glad to do it this has been a great discussion Stu. well thank you so much and hey we will see you again soon